Russell Westbrook is washed up. Russ needs to retire. Russ is a cancer to the locker room and blah, blah, blah. These were just 1% of the things that were said about him just over a season ago. But now the joke is on everyone else. Russ has been balling out. And if the media won't give him his credit, we will. Before we start, let's make something clear. We can't pretend that Russ didn't deserve some criticism for his play on the Lakers. He was a poor defender and a turnover machine. Love him or not, those are the facts. Facts. But I think we can all agree that the hate he received from sports personalities around the world was simply uncalled for. He was the joke of the NBA, and former NBA players turned analysts love to talk about how much of a family the NBA is. But that 2022 season showed everyone's true colors. And again, he did play the worst basketball of his career in a Lakers uniform, and it's more than okay to point that out. But to nitpick every single one of his games and then ignore his good games just isn't right. The sad truth about this whole situation is this. Media outlets only do what's going to get them the most views, clicks, and money, even if that means making a joke out of someone's career and a name like Russell Westbrook. If Russ shot 3 for 12 from the field one game, you best believe ESPN, Bleacher Report, Overtime, and the official NBA page and every other main basketball outlet would post at least four to five clips of his bad misses or turnovers. And it was like this every single game. And that's because that's what their viewers wanted to see. Every game that the Lakers lost, they immediately blamed it on Russ. And the crazy part is, he was literally the most positive player on that Lakers squad. When the Lakers were losing, everyone, including LeBron, showcased bad body language on way too many occasions. But Russ was always seen jumping up and down on the bench, clapping for his teammates no matter if they were up or down. Then, after the trade, the Lakers started winning and made the Western Conference Finals. So that automatically means it was Russ's fault, right? That's what everyone would lead you to assume. But do you want to know the real reason they started winning? Because they added Jared freaking Vanderbilt, Rui Hachimura, D'Angelo Russell, and Malik Beasley. These were literally some of the best role players in the entire league. And not to mention Jared Vanderbilt was a Defensive Player of the Year level candidate. And he had already transformed the Timberwolves and the Jazz's defense prior to joining the Lake Show. So my point is, the Lake were not successful that year due to Russ being gone. They were successful because they added multiple new pieces. They would have had the same success with those new pieces with Russ still on the roster. The Lakers were a bad team with or without Russ pre-trade deadline last year, but trading him was a blessing in disguise. Because after having an outstanding individual playoff performance with Kawhi and Paul George down in his first playoff as a Clipper versus Phoenix, he showed he still had a lot left in the tank. And this season is proof. One area he's been very good in is finishing. He's currently top five among all guards in shots less than five feet when you factor in attempts. At 35 years old, he can still get to the rim at a high level. It's hilarious to watch how easily he can bully damn near any point guard in the NBA by using his brute strength in the post. And the fact that he's finishing these shots at a high level this year really adds a new dynamic to the Clippers' offense. And due to his strength, his decrease in speed and explosiveness doesn't really hurt him. Even if a defender is able to stay with him step for step, he will just put those huge shoulders shoulders into your chest and move you out of the way like you weren't even there. Like I said, it really gives this Clipper offense a new dynamic. Because now, not only are they one of the best shooting teams in the NBA, which means defenses will be forced to spread the court, but now, as a defense, you can't spread the floor too much because if Russ even sees a small opening, he's going to be flying downhill with a full head of steam. And nobody wants that. He plays less than 23 minutes as well, which is perfect when it comes to saving his energy. So now he can be at 100% every time he checks in. Back with the Lakers, he was playing well over 30 minutes per game. And due to his wild play style, playing him that long could be the opposite of beneficial more times than not. But Ty Lue playing him a drastically lower amount of minutes than he's accustomed to is actually amazing for Russ and the team. Being on the floor less will limit his turnovers and his energy. A fatigued Russ holds little to no value on the court. His entire game thrives on flying around and out hustling everyone. So 23 minutes per night is a nice sweet spot. The fact that he's so efficient on the inside allows him to be on the floor with either Harden or Kawhi, sometimes even both. We know he isn't a shooter, but when you're this good at getting to the rim, it really doesn't matter and we are seeing that now. His finishing opens up another great part of his game, and that's passing the rock. He's currently around the 30s and 40s in assists per game, which is great since he only plays a limited amount of minutes, and the majority of players ranked in front of him are all playing well over 30 minutes. Since Russ has been so effective getting paint touches, this allows him to easily dump off passes to the big man standing in the dunker spot, something he's been great at for his entire career, especially when he had Steven Adams in OKC. It's clear that he isn't the best primary decision maker and passer for an offense, but as a secondary 
secondary playmaker, there aren't too many better in the league right now. That's why I really love when he and Harden are on the floor. Harden will have the ball in his hands while Russ plays off of the ball. Once the ball does touch his hands, he doesn't have to worry about getting others involved in forcing passes. He can just go in full attack mode. This also just makes the offense flow so much better. And his hustle has been phenomenal for this Clippers roster, who in spurts can look a little lackadaisical. Once Russ checks in, all of that changes. His offensive and defensive rebounding jumps off my screen every time I watch a Clippers game. He's averaging over five rebounds per game in just 23 minutes. For all of the guards who qualify, Russ is third in the NBA in offensive rebounds. Offensive rebounds equals more possessions for the offense, and more possessions for a lethal team like the Clippers equals a lot of dubs in the win column. This skill alone is why this team needs him on the floor. It's rare to find an elite rebounding guard, especially one who's elite at grabbing offensive boards, which are harder than grabbing them on the defensive end. This is a skill that can win them close games in the playoffs, and who knows, maybe even in the finals. However, the one area of his game that shocked everyone is his defense. I never thought I would say the word defense and Russ in the same video and it'd be a positive thing. He has a reputation for being one of the worst point guard defenders in the NBA, among other stars at the position. His poor defense alone has literally lost big games in the past. For example, the OKC vs. Warriors series where he single-handedly damn near gave up more points than he scored, then his time in LA certainly didn't help his case because in spurts, he was even worse on that end. But in a Clipper jersey, he's completely turned his defense around. And honestly, I can't believe it. Now, will he make an all-defensive team like he thinks he will? Definitely not. But that doesn't mean he hasn't been a good defender this season. Ty Lu is using him in a way that the Lakers tried to, but it's hard to play with 100% effort on defense every night for a team and fan base who literally laughs and clowns you while also telling you not to shoot a jumper from three. I don't know about you, but there's no way I can give my all in that toxic of an environment. Your mental affects your performance, and we're seeing that now. He's been as happy as we've seen him in a while, and it's showing when it comes to energy defensively. For the first time in his career, his role is to play defense and be a pest, and he's fulfilling that role. It's clear that he thinks highly of this defense too. Remember, not too long ago, he said this, ain't too many people defending better than me at this point if we keep it honest, but I'll let the numbers speak for that and I'll let y'all talk about it, but we just keeping it a buck. Ain't too many people defending better than me at this point position all around the league, honestly. I don't need it, but unfortunately, I haven't had one because I don't know. But I've been very deserving at it at some point in my career. But if that's what happens this year, I'd be grateful and blessed for that to happen. But what do y'all think? Does Russell Westbrook's performance this season make the Clippers title favorites? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.